So good afternoon. I'm John Thiel, Professor of Religious Studies here at Fairfield University. Welcome to our panel discussion devoted to the career, long work of our colleague and friend, Paul Lakeland, who stands on the cusp of retirement and who is most deserving of our recognition and appreciation. For opening remarks, I invite to the podium Dr. Richard Greenwald, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Politics. Dean Greenwald. Thank you very much. On behalf of the university and the administration, faculty, and students, I want to welcome you here. I uh, have to use the moment to say a couple of things, though, if that's OK. So unlike everyone here, I think I probably know Paul for the shortest amount of time, right? uh, just six years. But I've witnessed uh, something that speaks volumes. And he's been a constant voice for justice on this campus and a lion of the faculty. Um, for the graciousness he's presented, but also for the way he's mentored so many on this campus, so many faculty. There's something about the way he carries himself, uh, the way he watches the goings on in, in the meetings, and um, sometimes has a smile uh, about it. <laughs> and the chats he has in the hallways with colleagues, he's been a trusted member of the faculty, and everyone knows that. Um, and I say he's guided this faculty at the university for so long that he's helped cement the mission into the culture. And that's a hopeful thing. And so I've been thinking about what I might add to tonight. I'm not a theologian. I don't know Paul all that much. So I did what academics do. I read some of Paul's books and articles. Right? Um, and I uh, read his uh, 2018 book, Catholicism at the Crossroads. And in that book, he addressed the theme of hope. And I just want to quote Paul, quote, hope is not a feeling that everything will turn out well, but a conviction that the work is worth doing no matter how it turns out. And to me, that sums up Paul. Hope is the means more than the ends. And I want to thank you uh, for all your service and all the hope you've given us. So thank you. Our program this afternoon is entitled Thinking as the Church, an Appreciation of the Theology of Paul Lakeland. Some of you may have noticed that that phrase, thinking as the church, is a play on a famous phrasing of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. Ignatius is most known for the genius of his spiritual exercises, which chart the course of a powerful emotional journey through the Christian drama. But even many who make the spiritual exercises don't know that Ignatius appended to the exercises a catalog of various rules to guide the spiritual director, and through the director, the person who makes the exercises. These rules include what he calls rules for thinking with the church, which include the following directions, quote, with all judgment of our own put aside, we ought to keep our minds disposed and ready to be obedient in everything to the hierarchical church. And to keep ourselves right in all things, we ought to hold fast to this principle. What I see as white, I will believe to be black if the hierarchical church thus determines it." End quote. Paul Lakeland would not agree with this. <laughs> he has developed a theology of the agency of the entire church that would have all believers with a common authority thinking and acting as the church that they are all together. We are very fortunate to have with us today three internationally recognized Catholic theologians, Roger Haight, Massimo Fagioli, and Elizabeth Johnson who will offer reflections on Paul's work, reflections to which Paul will respond. We will enjoy and learn from the dialogue among our panelists and then open our discussion to the audience. So our first speaker is Roger Haight of the Society of Jesus. Professor Haight earned his doctorate at the University of Chicago Divinity School, writing on the topic of Roman Catholic modernism at the turn of the 20th century. He has held successive professorships 
at four Jesuit graduate schools of theology, at Loyola School of Theology in the Ateneo de Manila in the Philippines, at the Jesuit School of Theology in Chicago, at Regis College in the Toronto School of Theology, and at Weston Jesuit School of Theology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He is currently visiting professor at Union Theological Se Seminary in New York City. Professor Haight is the author of 14 books on a wide variety of theological topics, on the nature of theology as a discipline, Christology, ecclesiology, grace, liberation theology, spirituality, and the dialogue of Christian theology with science and evolution. He is a past president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Roger Haight. Thanks, John. Thank you <clears throat> for that, uh, <laughs> that wonderful introduction. Um, I am very, very pleased to be here. Uh, Paul retires with mixed emotions, of course, but I'm absolutely thrilled to be uh, among the uh, people who uh, remember his contribution to theology and so on. Now, I'm going to go right into my text because I'm on the clock here. <laughs> Paul finished his doctorate at Vanderbilt University in 1981, <clears throat> the same year that he joined the theology department at Fairfield, and he has consistently contributed to the discipline of theology for over 40 years. This panel has the pleasant task to review Paul's work, reflect on it with you, and pose some questions that might stimulate more reflection by himself on his own work. <laughs> Given the size of this panel, uh, we decided to divide what Paul's work into three parts, three distinct themes that developed chronologically but are more interrelated than serial sequence. Three topics encompass, first, his basic framework for pursuing the discipline of theology, second, his study of the church, and third, his attention to the laity in the church. So the first theme of the framework of theology, which I'll talk about, is, was set in works published before 2000 and treated issues that underlie systematic or constructive theology they deal with the worldview and the philosophy relative to theology, with questions of context and relationship of faith and religion to society. The second theme then turns to the domain of theology where Paul's distinctive work was done on the, in the field of uh, uh, ecclesiology, where Massimo Fagioli will focus on this aspect of Paul's work, and then the third theme concerns the members of the church, the laity in contrast to ordained ministers or office holders. And Elizabeth Johnson will highlight Paul's major contributions in this field of the theology of the laity. So you got the, the framework here. So with that breakdown on the panel's presentations <clears throat> uh, of Paul's work, let me now turn to what I call fundamental issues that define the framework of his theology. Looking back on the corpus of an author, one can find common themes that run, run, run through it, of course. Um, they may even function as consistent basic principles for the whole body of the person's writings. And this is true in Paul's case. But in fact, as a matter of fact, um, writing most often emerges piecemeal. Each work flows from current events, from the invitation of this group or another for a talk, or even from a, just a bright idea. So this sets up a creative tension with, between Paul's opinions at any given time and the deeper convictions or principles that guide his theology, and that's where I want to go this afternoon. <clears throat> 
So I find in four books he published between 1984 and 1997, four basic principles that characterize his theology consistently from beginning to end and remain crucial for our theology today. Together they provide a skeleton for a coherent treatise on fundamental, the fundamentals of the discipline of theology. So first, I draw some first principles from Paul's thesis at Vanderbilt where he published, which, which, which he published as, quote, the politics of salvation, the Hegelian idea of the state. Whoa. <laughs> I don't think of Paul as an Hegelian, uh, as I might think of a Thomist or an Argenian or a Whiteheadian and so on, Heideggerian. Uh, in other words, Paul is not in a school that trapped his thought. The doctoral, but doctoral theses often inculcate basic principles with lasting effect. His work gave him the opportunity to study Hegel's view of religion and Christianity and their role in human, uh, human history <clears throat> and the relationship between Christianity and the state, church and government, church and politics, and theology's relationship to the discipline of philosophy, basic, basic issues which if if you don't talk about them, they're still operating in your psyche. More particularly, Paul drew out of Hegel's view of knowledge and the conception, uh, drew, drew out Hegel's knowledge, Hegel's view of knowledge and the conception of God, and analyzed how Hegel thought about God's operation in the secular world, how being a Christian positions a person relative to society and government and more pub pub publicly, the relationships between church and state. These are basic issues. Paul's thesis thus established an historicist framework of thinking <clears throat> in the sense that the premise of the discussion is movement through time in history. Hegel gave him a perspective, a historical perspective, rather than a specific language one that is quite distinct from uh, neo-Thomism, for example, or neo-Aristotelianism. Things are in movement, things are moving. Uh, so if you're, if you're staying the same, you're not in contact with reality. Uh, this is a basic change in theology, uh, which some theologians get and others do not. <laughs> So uh, the first principle of his theology, which I gather, gather from his thesis is, quote, the framework for theological reflection lies in situating human beings as a community developing across time, always in motion, always new. If you're a certain age, you can witness the things changing. <clears throat> Second. In 1984, published, uh, Paul published a short book entitled Freedom in Christ, an Introduction to Political Theology. The book sets forth in a personally invested and carefully constructed way the fundamental premises for doing theology in the light of the developments after the Second Vatican Council. It represents Paul's basic stance as a systematic theologian in the mid-1980s. Political theology, the title of the book, does not refer to a theology of politics in our sense of poli po po uh, party politics today. It, it, in theology, it has a broad abstract me meaning of negotiating social life, managing our society with a concern for the common good, politics, generally, running society. Political theology, therefore, looks at human existence from the perspective of the community rather than the individual. More concretely, political theology, as Paul understands, it's had two distinct sources in the 1960s, one from Germany, which was called political theology, and the other from Latin America, which was called liberation theology. This book, then, expresses Paul's own personal synthesis of topics that govern a true and relevant theology for American society. 
Theology must be found, quote, found, understood, and put into practice and validated within human secular experience, end of quote. Although theology would be could, should be relevant for uh, life and society, <clears throat> all theology, rather, should have a relevance for life and society, for an ethical comp have an eth ethical component, and be written with an appeal to service and action. I love this quote, quote, belief without action is empty, but action without belief is thrashing around in the dark. It's beautiful. You must have stolen that from somebody. Oh, no. <laughs> it's wonderful. British succinctness. Yes. Christian theology thus begins not with awe at a beautiful world, but with a certain indignation that as Christians we tolerate so much human suffering and abuse in our world. To sum up, I express, express the second principle of uh, Paul's theology uh, this way. Theology must work within a social liberationist rather than an individualist framework and must stimulate action. In 1990, Paul published Critical uh, Theology and Critical Theory. Critical theory refers to the analysis of society in an effort to unmask the assumptions underlying life in common and opening a pathway to human emancipation and construction of the good in a just society. I mean, we're very familiar today with opinions with no, no, no grounding. And that's what uh, critical theory is doing. It's looking to find the hidden suppositions on people's opinions that don't make it don't, not correspond with reality. He first appeal, appeals to <clears throat> critical theory, this school in Frankfurt that was uh, founded after the sec First World War uh, with a Marxist, Marxist tinge criticism of society. But actually, he appeals more directly to a second generation of critical theory Jürgen, Moltma, uh, Jürgen, uh, Jürgen Habermas uh, for his own constructive work. <clears throat> Two fundamental ideas of Habermas find their way into Paul's theology. First, human societies are held together principally by linguistic communication. A set of common ideas or values communicated through language hold communities together. A good example of this would be the Constitution in the United States, for example. <clears throat> what holds unity and difference together, the second principle, is conversation. Exchanged aim at, high, at greater harmony and particular goals for the common good. The ideal for strategy for establishing the common good is civil conversation. And we all know what that is by its opposite today. But secondly, <clears throat> social conversation has its own rules. It requires truth and truthfulness rather than the simple desire to gain advantage and win. It also requires, in Paul's terms, quote, a willingness to give each member of the community or all partners in the dialogue equal voice and respect and attention, end of quote. So this principle translates the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth uh, on the Christian life into social terms and not just interpersonal terms. So not only love of friends, but love of enemies. Love that builds up the common wheel. So this yields the third principle of Paul's theology. <clears throat> Quote, theology needs a social anthropology, not just a personal individualist anthropology, and a way of thinking that engender community rather than exclusively attending to personal suffering of individuals. 
I now turn to Paul's fourth book of this early period in Fundamental Theology, which is entitled Postmodernity, Christian Identity in a Fragmented Age. Now, the term post-identity is a problem uh, because nobody knows what it means. Uh, <clears throat> it really doesn't have any content. It says it's a after modernity, and that's contentious. What is modernity? So it has no determinate meaning in itself other than being after something else, and the meaning of, the, of, of, of modernity itself is highly contentious. So some people like postmodernity because it means the end of modernity, and we go back to the traditionalism. And some people like uh, post postmodern because it means uh, <coughs> that, or they're worried about it because it means throwing out enlightenment values, which are the very basis of the American society, enlightenment values. So <clears throat> Paul identifies the basic cause of postmodernity, <clears throat> and it's this. Western enlightened reason was too sure of itself in its universal relevance. So the enlightenment was a good thing, but it was a little too cocksure of itself. Over against this over, overconfidence, there gradually developed a sense of what I referred to earlier, a sense of time and change that showed that reason itself is always conditioned by the particular circumstances in which a group is reasoning or a culture is reasoning. So it's never reason. It's always somebody's reason or some culture's reason. So the reasoning of the Western Enlightenment doesn't mean it's the reasoning of a Chinese or an African uh, and so on. So suddenly, <laughs> the pillars of Christian theology begin to wobble. The very term God does not fit in Buddhist cultures. The place of Jesus Christ seems to be alongside or other next to other religious traditions, and, when what happens to, and then what happens to Christian supremacy. We're in a new world here. In response to the new problem of God, Paul does not offer a concept that he thinks everybody is going to accept. Rather, he appeals to the tradition set in the book of Job, where God speaks from the whirlwind of, a, of chaos. <clears throat> that God transcends and orders God's love towards all things discriminately, particularly towards each one, and does not attend to each me by intervention at every difficulty in life, every impasse. Paul puts it this way, quote, human beings have neither reason nor right to claim to be the meaning of the universe, end of quote. That's, that's changing your mind if, if, if you didn't live there already. He then looks inside tradition towards the mystics and the prophets for an answer. God is encountered within and as transcendent. God, always present, does not need to intervene in our history but urges human agency in the pursuit of justice. To formulate the fourth principle of Paul's foundations of theology, I do it this way, quote, in several respects, several respects, theology has to address a new intellectual culture today, beyond modernity, beyond the modernity of the Vatican II, reacted to and responded to. We're in a new world. I conclude this <clears throat> with this kind of overview or summary. In his early writings, Paul Lakeland developed a coherent social base for theological understanding. And it is as relevant and needed today as when he composed it, which is striking in a rapidly clo uh, moving culture and society. It presupposes historical consciously, historically conscious thinking. 
recognizing things are always changing, sets individual concern in a wider social context and is critical with questions that resonate with today's problems and is critical with questions that resonate with today's problems. So my final question is in a question addressed to Paul, and it's this. How would he, so steeped in our culture throughout the 40 years, formulate the most pressing theological question at this moment of history from the perspective of our country? Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Uh, our second presenter is Dr. Massimo Fagioli, who is Professor of Theology and Religious Studies at Villanova University, an internationally recognized authority on the history and theology of the Second Vatican Council. He is widely read, too, in his frequent contributions uh, on Catholic culture to La Croix Interna International and to Commonweal Magazine. His books and articles have been published in more than 10 languages. His most recent books are The Liminal Papacy of Pope Francis, Moving Toward Global Catholicity, published by Orbis Books in 2020, and Joe Biden and Catholicism in the United States, published by Bayard Press in 2021. He is the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Vatican II, published by Oxford, Oxford University Press this year, and he is currently uh, at work on a history of the Roman Curia to be published uh, again by Oxford University Press. Dr. Fagioli lives in the Philadelphia area with his wife and their two children. Please join me in welcoming Professor Massimo Fagioli. Thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to deepen my knowledge of Paul's work in ecclesiology and to share the panel with, with uh, Elizabeth Johnson and Roger Aid. Also because this opportunity comes at a momentous time in the Catholic Church and for ecclesiology especially for Pope Francis, synodality, and all that. In these brief remarks, I will try to outline and in the ask, ask some questions of Paul about three ecclesiological themes that he has addressed. The first one, uh, communio ecclesiology and different ecclesiological models. The second, uh, his critique of radical orthodoxy. And the third one, uh, the legacy of the Second Vatican Council. So first one, communio ecclesiology. Paul offered an, a, an assessment of communio ecclesiology when that model was still the model in vogue in the institutional church, at least since the mid 1980s. And this model has been, if not substituted, at least juxtaposed with other models since the election of Pope Francis in, 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 in 2013. But already 10 years before Pope Francis' election, in his 2003 book, The Liberation of the Laity, Paul offered a nuanced critique of communio ecclesiology, and I quote here. If, we, if what we mean by communio is an inward-looking, self-congratulatory, and fearful huddling together against the forces of modernity, the communion of the 19th century church then mission will mean little more than the periodic excoriation of the outside world. But if communion means a generous and loving association of free and faithful children of God, then the dynamic access of love without which it is not love at all, spills over into a mission to the whole human race, one marked by a generous sharing of the knowledge that God wills to save the world. End quote. This nuanced critique is indicative of other important motives of Paul's thought. In an essay published in 2015 in the volume titled A Church with o Open Doors, Paul analyzed uh, 
three models of apostolicity. First, what he called build it and they will come, uh, which he defined wholly centripetal and apostolicity of maintenance. The second, the church of the new evangelization. And the third one, apostolicity of kenosis. And clearly, his preference is for the third one, a kenotic ecclesiology. Quote, while there is some value to the first, maintenance, and the second, new evangelization, it is in the third, kenotic uh, form of uh, apostolicity that a vigorous postmodern ecclesiological posture can be discerned. This may be the only one of the three that demonstrates realistic hope rather than muted despair, and perhaps the only one that follows the Christic paradigm of death to self for the sake of new life, end quote. He came back again to this in his 2013 book, um, A Council That Will Never End on, on, on Lumen Gentium. And he, there, he inserted his preference for a kenotic ecclesiology in his treatment and yearning for what he, he called an ecclesiology of humility. Quote, the fundamental theological issue in fostering the grace of self-doubt even among the official teachers in the church is the recognition that the grace of God is spread throughout the world, end quote. So here Paul's fundamental ecclesiological option could be summed up in the title of a section of, of his book on, on Lumen Gentium, Kenosis in the Church, Kenosis of the Church. And here there's a passage that, there's a passage that I find prescient of what he defined was the mission of, of the church to be like the, the Good Samaritan that was written almost, I mean, many years before Fratelli Tutti, which as you know has at the center that, that parable. So it's one of the things that I find not just in, insightful, but uh, saying something before of what was going to happen with the, the, the uh, this pontificate. Second point, radical orthodoxy. A second theme that is indicative of Paul's axiology is his critique of radical orthodoxy, an alternative th 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 theological reading of the history and status of modernity, postmodernity, but also a theological reconstruction of the contemporary that took its name from a title the title of a collection of essays published in, in 1999, Radical Orthodoxy and New Theology. In his 2003 book, The Liberation of the, of the Laity, in chapter seven titled Mission in the Postmodern World, Paul chose as exergo a quote from, from, from Joseph Komonchak, and that chapter paid homage to Komonchak's Physiology and an attempt to go beyond the left and right-wing stereotypes. So there, uh, Paul drew from Charles Taylor, his reading of modernity and, and uh, secularity, and engaged in a deep critique of the ecclesiological assumptions of radical orthodoxy, referring to John Milburn, Catherine Pickstock, Graham Ward, and in the West Stanley Howarbus. Paul invited fundamentally radical orthodox theologians to a rereading of Gaudium et Spes, which I find very, very important. But it was not an all out uncompromising critique of radical orthodoxy. Paul acknowledged the contribution of some radical orthodox argument for the church's mission in the struggle against the dehumanizing program of global capitalism, Christian mission in the face of global capitalism is a blend of resistance and weakness. On the other hand, Paul identified a certain, what I would call essentialism, when radical orthodoxy talks about the church. Quote, the mission of the church and the world is primarily conducted through countless millions of individual decisions made by lay people independently 
of ecclesiastical authority, end quote. This critique of radical orthodoxy and his reading of modernity and postmodernity gives us more than a glimpse into the, uh, the, the ecclesiological thought of Paul Lakeland in his 2009 book, Church Living Communion, he advocated for an inductive ecclesiology, an empirical ecclesiology, taking from Lonergan's turn from a classicist worldview to historically mindedness, as well as from Germanion's 2007 book on postmodern ecclesiology. Here, ecclesiology intersects with the idea of doctrinal pluralism drawing also from Lonergan's 1971 Marquette Lecture, not just a development of doctrine, but a new kind of development of doctrine. Third and final point, the legacy of the Second Vatican Council. In the book, The Liberation of the Lady, Paul identified clearly the limits within the legacy of the Second Vatican Council. And I quote here, beyond Beyond the story of the mixed fortunes of Vatican II, there is a pressing need to address issues that were largely untouched by the council fathers. So let us suppose for a moment that Vatican III is about to open and that we are responsible for setting its agenda. What would we want to see the uh, uh, council addressing? And in this list, there is, Paul uh, puts on, on that list, the nature of, of ministry, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the democratization of church procedures, church, and capitalism, the role of, of the laity. A few years later, in 2007, in Catholicism at the crossroads, Paul came back to this, uh, this problem of what to make of the Second Vatican Council half a century later, and, and, and he proposed 10 steps toward a more adult church, which is to summarize what we are talking about now in this nodal process, basically. Um, and so here I see very much uh, in Paul's proposal a foreshadowing of, of Pope Francis Pontificate in some strange ways, very, very insightful. In 2009, in his book, Church Living Communion, Paul named the problem of elite theologizing and the need to look at the real church together with the need to reread Gaudium et Spes for a more inductive ecclesiology. I haven't read much that is more foreshadowing of Pope Francis Pontificate, honestly. Now, if it's not clear yet what will happen to one of Paul's wishes, democracy in church life, other invitations of Lakeland of almost 15 years ago have become now papal language, such as when, he, when, Pope, when Paul invited us to be intelligent or practice discernment, or talked about the church as hospice, as, as pilgrim, as immigrant, as pioneer. This belongs not just to the, absolutely not to the discarding of the Second Vatican Council, but to a re-owning, repossessing Vatican II, not just its letter, but also the spirit in theology and what we have seen, I believe, in these last 10 years in uh, the papal teaching. Uh, it's important here that when it's about the assessment of what happened of, of the Second Vatican Council, Paul Lakeland, Already in 2013, I identified the major obstacle in the reception of the Second Vatican Council, not simplistically with, with, with clerical or institutional resistance and conservatism, but with a lack of historical consciousness. Quote, the central uh, problem is that of history. There are places in the documents in general and Illumen Gentium in particular were texts that ignore the element of historicity in tradition occur alongside those that recognize the doctrinal importance of our historical method. Here perhaps is where the business of Lumen Gentium is most unfinished. In the conflicts within the text, we can see unresolved tensions within the council itself." End quote. Um, so 
here, I believe, I, I want to conclude with four questions that I, I gave Paul e in advance, because it, there are big problems, uh, <laughs> with, not with the thought, but, but with our situation in the church. I mean, first question is kenotic ecclesiology, kenosis. How to imagine a sustainable kenosis in this new age of, norm of normalization of war, of culture war, what it means to be a kenotic church in Ukraine, for example. Second, democracy in church life. Today, what kind of, of, of trust in democracy in the church we can have given what is happening to our democracies in, 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 in our political system? Third, the problem of elite theologizing has become even more dire, more serious. I, I believe for a certain crisis of the role of theology, not just in academia, but in the church. I think this is one of these problem with Pope Francis Pontificate. And finally, fourth, yes, there is absolutely a need for a, a more inductive ecclesiology, but I think there is also a new and emerging new hermeneutical questions what these texts of the Second Vatican Council mean. Just think about the liturgical reform, for example. So these are questions that I believe uh, Paul's thought has given us already a lot uh, to solve th these problems, but I just wanted to take this opportunity to ask him the, uh, these tough questions uh, and in front of everyone. <laughs> so I thank you again and see you later. <laughs>
I want to zero in on one subject, which I consider perhaps Paul's most original contribution, and that is his theology of the laity. As we know, the Roman Catholic Church is led and controlled by a small group of clergy, all men, celibate men, as Paul consistently and critically points out. Church structures give this group preeminence, not only in presiding over the sacraments and preaching the word, but also in governance and juridical matters, handling finances, making personnel appointments, deciding policies, decreeing what is and is not allowed in doctrinal and ethical matters. So strong is this structure at the present time, Paul notes ruefully, that when people hear the word church, they usually think of the hierarchy or the clergy, the Vatican, Rome, the institution in other words, although 95% of the people who comprise the church are not part of that group. So what else can be said about these people besides that they are, quote, not clergy? <laughs> in numerous works, Paul has been working out a theological answer to that question. He wrote books such as The Liberation of the Laity, In Search of an Accountable Church in 2003, which won the Catholic Press Award for Best Book in Theology. He also wrote Catholicism at the Crossroads, How the Laity Can Change the Church, 2007. And in numerous probing articles, he has addressed subjects such as raising lay consciousness, lay participation in church decision making, and the maturity of the lay vocation. He builds a rich picture of the positive religious identity, the vocation and the mission of the majority of baptized people who live their lives in the midst of the secular world. Significantly, Paul works with the understanding that a renewed theology of the laity is actually a renewed theology of the church. To put this in context, I would like first to highlight Paul's view of his own role as a theologian, which will frame, I think, why he pursues the question of the laity with such urgency. Then I will present all too briefly four highlights of the theology of the laity. I note at the outset that Paul thinks about the laity from the inside, so to speak, as someone with the experience of being himself a layman, while in younger days he once was clergy. Very few people have done such serious work on this subject, and Paul's biography gives him a special wisdom. So his role as a theologian. In 2019, Paul was president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. And in his presidential address to members that year, which is always a significant occasion, he emphasized the role of the theologian, theologian which he defined as that of a servant, a servant of the gospel, working to counter forces that dehumanize people in society. It was, I think, an important act of public self-definition. <laughs> Instead of being wrapped up in academic affairs only, the theologian, Paul, needs to engage in crises where people are being harmed and walk a path of what he calls spiritual resistance on behalf of the humanity of all people in the name of the God of love. It was very moving to hear him describe how he took this phrase, spiritual resistance, from a group of French theologians, all priests, who resisted the Nazi occupation of France in the 1940s by, wait for it, secretly publishing a journal. <laughs> an anti-Nazi journal. Right? In this view, and in their view, 
Their fight was inspired by the gospel for the very soul of people so they would not be seduced into collaborating with evil. The effects of this spiritual resistance were daunting. One brave Jesuit involved with the project was captured and executed by the Gestapo, and they all lived in fear. Now, drawing parallels between the psychic force of Nazi propaganda and the strength today of neoliberal global capitalism, which tames those of us who benefit from its <coughs> safety and luxuries, Paul insisted that the task of the theologian is to engage in a similar kind of spiritual resistance. Quote, when you believe in a God of love and you define love as justice, there really is no other course of action if indeed the individual today or the whole of occupied France back then is not to lose their soul. So what is the role of the theologian? Into the breach. Be a servant. Struggle for humanity under threat with all the vigor of your learning of your mind and your heart. Now Paul takes his own advice when he mounts spiritual resistance to the malaise in the church by developing a robust theology of the laity. And here I will highlight only four key points and all too briefly. First, the history of the church and the laity. Right? Paul has a clear-eyed view of church history and it is radical. And so I quote you, in the first two centuries, there were no lay people, only Christians. Think of it. Of course there were leaders, and Paul is clear that while the church did not come full-blown out of a blueprint in Jesus' mind, episcopoi, overseers, or bishop leaders in the tradition of the apostles were part of the early organization of the church and should remain so. But these did not function within the system of celibate clerical culture separated from the laity that currently marks the church. In the first two centuries, there were no lay people, only Christians. Then due to historical circumstances, the community began to take on the structure of the Roman Empire, setting up internal top-down hierarchical systems of governance. In subsequent centuries, clerical celibacy was mandated. The papacy was isolated and other changes crept in. The result is that lay people today have little or no voice in the way things are run and no voice and no vote except with their feet. And Paul writes, much of the church's dysfunctionality today is tied to how it squanders lay experience. So with that framework of history, secondly, identity. In resisting this situation and seeking a remedy, Paul is very much a thinker in the spirit of the Second Vatican Council and its theology of the church as basically the community of the holy people of God. Drawing deeply on the theology of Yves Congar, who greatly influenced the outcome of the council on this point, he argues that the baseline for understanding the people of God is, and I quote, a community of radical equality before God in virtue of a common baptism. This is the starting point for a theology of the laity. Each person who is baptized puts on Christ, is consecrated by the Spirit, and is called to the mission of making God's love effective in a world of need. Altogether, such people form the community of the church. And the core of what binds them is, quote, the experience that the loving care of God for us is supremely available in our intimacy with the story of Jesus Christ. So third point, mission. The experience of God's loving care for us through Jesus Christ is not given to the baptized for their own good alone. They have a mission. 
to share and spread the love of God in the world, which Paul writes, quote, means to call the world to its own deepest selfhood as a human community. And here is where a theology of the laity begins to reshape understanding of the church. Because unlike the clergy, the life of the laity is oriented toward the world. Their lives are enmeshed in the stresses of everyday life, the joys and struggles of family, finances, employment or unemployment, parenting, neighbors, politics, education, business, healthcare, sports, entertainment, and on and on. In these secular settings, lay people are the ones who carry out the mission of the church, which is to be the loving presence of God in the world, spiritually resisting the forces that dehumanize people and promoting human dignity. Now, Paul knows that this happens today in a pluralistic and complex society where many people get along just fine with no religion at all. The mission of the laity is not to make everything all churchy. <laughs> Rather, acting with mature independence and practical self-direction, they are called to enact the love of God precisely in a secular world. And betraying a very Catholic sensibility, Paul argues that the secular world does not necessarily mean a godless world opposed to the sacred. He draws on Bonhoeffer, Habermas, and others to show that the secular world has its own integrity and basic goodness, although sin is ever present. He recalls, for example, that regretfully, the institutional church did not speak out against, but encouraged slavery, anti-Semitism, and the subjugation of women, thereby failing catastrophically in its mission. The church learned the demands of the gospel in tandem with the growing human wisdom of the secular world. So this is the world created by God and suffused with the presence of Christ and the spirit while fully operational by its own natural and social laws. A lay spirituality locates the primary mission of the church conducted daily by lay people squarely within this secular world loved by God. Which leads to the fourth point, structure. Here Paul articulates a vital principle. Leadership must always be imagined as a function of the identity of the community being led, never the other way around. Thus the ordained leaders whose ministry is focused within the church on sacraments, preaching, and pastoral care should be seen as support staff. <laughs> I couldn't believe when I first read that, Paul. That was <laughs> <laughs> Their work is vital, but it is in service to the church's mission, which is carried out mainly by laity. And in turn, the laity are not the simple faithful, obedient to their pastors, Informed by the gospel, they carry out the mission of the church independent of ecclesiastical oversight, exercising their baptismal status as priest, prophets, and servant leaders in the spirit of Christ. Millions of their individual decisions in everyday life make Christ present in the world and further the coming of the reign of God. Together with their pastors, they form the community of faith. Paul's radical revisioning of the lay clergy relation only barely touches on what he has written or on this whole subject. But it leads him to argue that we need new patterns of ministry to match the idea of church as a communion of the people of God first rather than as an institution first. And we need new structures to express the growing adulthood and maturity of the laity. If you are inclined to disagree with this analysis, Paul has one more argument to offer. <laughs> In the eschaton, at the end of the world, 
in heaven. There will be no more Vatican, no more Roman Curia or church bureaucracy, no more institutional church. These are means to an end. Just as in the first two centuries there were no laity, only Christians, so too at the end. What will endure is the communion of faithful people amid a world redeemed. So to conclude, Paul's view of the role of the theologian as servant of the gospel intertwines with his theology of the laity. Into the breach, lay people, inspired by the gospel and nurtured by the Eucharist, engage in spiritual resistance against the greed, the lust for power, the violence that so harms human beings and the natural world we inhabit. Make God's love real in the world. All else in the church should get arranged to make this happen. With this theology of the laity, a new world is possible. Whether there will be a vibrant church at all in the future, I think, might well depend on Paul's theology of the laity being taken seriously. And here is the point for reflection and my question. The word laity is a collective noun. Like team or company, it encompasses different kinds of people while making their specifics invisible. For myself as a theologian with feminist leanings, when reading Paul's work, every time he writes laity, I see women. Men too, of course, but women are there as the majority of the 95%. Now the current clerical system is cemented into place by a theology of gender complementarity that defines man by nature as one who leads and decides, and woman by nature as one who nurtures and supports. In fact, the current clergy lay structure, as Paul describes and criticizes it, precisely mirrors the traditional male-female relationship father knows best. To argue theologically, that those ordained to preside at Eucharist, who are all men currently, should be seen as support staff and service to the church's mission, which is carried out by the laity, a majority all women, is to completely flip gender roles. The issue is, issue is further complicated by those today who either reject complementarity in favor of equality or do not identify with the gender binary at all. So my question for Paul today asks how he might further develop and deepen his powerful theology of the laity, both theoretically and practically, in view of gender theory and the very real gendered persons who are the church. Or to put it in other words, is it possible that we will never have a fully functioning laity until women participate fully in all the ministries of the church. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, it is an honor for me to introduce our friend and colleague, Paul Lakeland. Our visiting theologians have offered commentary on his published theological work, but I must begin with an in-house testimony that Paul has always been a very fine teacher. For the past 42 years, he's nurtured a couple of generations of students, many of whom have become trusted friends, grateful for his wisdom and guidance when they were undergraduates and even thereafter, and some of them are in the room today. He is the author of 10 books, has edited three more, and has published dozens of journal articles and book chapters. His most important book, The Liberation of the Laity, received the 2003 Catholic Press Association Award for the best book in the field of theology. More recently, in 2018, his book, The Wounded Angel, Fiction and the Religious Imagination, 
was awarded the best book in theology prize by the College Theology Society. In 2018 and 19, he served as president of the Catholic Theological Society of America. He was visiting professor at Yale Divinity School from 2008 to 2013. And in 2020, he received the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities Monica Helwig Award for contributions to Catholic intellectual tradition. Paul is the inaugural holder of the Aloysius P. Kelly SJ Chair in Catholic the uh, Studies, an appointment that he's held since 2004. And most importantly, in those same 19 years, he has built from scratch the university's program in Catholic Studies. For our undergraduates and interdisciplinary minor, and for the Fairfield community and the community at large, an annual slate of engaging lectures, panel discussions, and even concerts devoted to, as he occasionally puts it, all things Catholic. I could spend much more time cataloging your achievements, Paul, but like everyone else, I'm really eager to hear what you have to say in response to our distinguished guests. So ladies and gentlemen, Paul Lakeland. How long do you have? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, grateful to see you all here, and I'm very grateful from uh, what I've uh, heard from my esteemed colleagues here. And um, as I listen to their questions, uh, I don't think you should expect me to be answering all of them, but now I know what I'm supposed to be doing when, as so many of you have asked me already, what are you going to do when you retire? <laughs> I'm going to answer those questions. So a few thoughts, right? So you know, in, in some ways, I blundered into this life of four decades as a Catholic theologian, the last two as an ecclesiologist. My first love was literature. And if I'd not been a Jesuit at the time that I completed my Oxford degree reading English, as they quaintly like to put it, I would probably have continued on that path. Instead, I, I spent a couple of years working in religious journalism and then went on to theological studies at London University. By the time I left the Jesuits during my doctoral studies in theology at Vanderbilt University, I was well and truly trapped. <laughs> trapped. And then I got lucky when Fairfield University's first choice for a spot in the Religious Studies Department declined their offer. <laughs> and they turned to this Englishman who had never actually applied for the job. That was done for him by his Dr. Fater, uh, Professor Peter Hodgson, to whom I am uh, permanently grateful. And they invited me to come and interview though I would have to pay my own way from London to Fairfield for the interview. So I stumped up the money and here I am. My friends and colleagues who've spoken so generously have found a pattern in path in my career that one can, of course, only recognize in retrospect. Did I know that my academic interests would develop the way they did? I don't believe so. And yet, and yet, the one book that none of them mentioned was my first book. Not much more than a large pamphlet, really. Still a Jesuit, I was sitting in my room one evening, and a senior Jesuit stuck his head around the door and said, is there anything you would like to write a book about? <laughs> yes, I said. And thus was born my first literary child, Can Women Be Priests? One of the first such books in English, and dedicated to the argument that there were, and still are, no genu genuine theological obstacles to the ordination of women to the priesthood. And, by the way, it had an imprimatur, 
In those days, if you were a clergy, you had to get one. It had an imprimatur from the Diocese of Cork in Ireland, <laughs> something it could not receive today. <laughs> what I think this shows is that the servant theologian role that Beth Johnson identified was there from the beginning, even if I didn't know it then, because the little book blended theology and a concern for the life of the church moving forward. No, it, it wasn't about the laity exactly, but to respond to Beth's question at the end of her remarks, it shows that from the beginning I had some sort of sense that gender identity had little to do with any roles within the church. Today, the sense of the faithful is way ahead of the magisterium on many issues, including gender. And whatever work I do in the future, it will honor those intuitions and seek to further their acceptability. I think the early work that I did, including the heavy lifting in the Hegel book and the books on critical theory and postmodernity, were probably, as Roger acutely sensed, propedeutic to the five books I've written in the last 20 years. My friends are kind, and I suppose I have, to a degree, led the charge on developing a lay ecclesiology. But in the end, these books are works of what the French call haute vulgarisation, the classy French term for popularization. Because I have mostly been writing not just about the laity, but for the laity. They should be seen as taking complex theological arguments and putting them into plain English. So if I am a servant theologian, then perhaps so in the model of what the late lamented Ada Maria Isazi Diaz called the theologian as a professional insider. Any further work I do to respond to Roger's question will continue to try to take the temperature of the grassroots church and suggest a path of action to assuage whatever fears I discern there. My guess is that it might involve contributing to overcoming the polarization of American society by addressing the false dichotomies that bedevil discourse about religion and secularity. One thing that has graced my final decade at Fairfield is that we got ourselves a pope who said all the things I have been saying for at least 20 years. <laughs> It would be nice to imagine he had read my books. <laughs> but the truth is that much of my own theological inspiration like his comes from his native Latin America. I have taught liberation theology for 40 years. The first 30 of them under occasional Episcopal suspicion. The last 10 with what I like to believe is a kind of papal blessing. And I think it's here that I first began to think about the need for a humbler church, distinguished by what I have called kenotic discipleship, whose method is inductive, thought out from below, among the laity. I just have zero tolerance for ecclesiastical cant, and I'm grateful to Massimo for pushing me to think this through a bit further. For now, I can only say that I expect to write at least one more book, and this one will pursue the ecclesiological significance of kenosis, which I think is worked out most fruitfully in Simon Weil's analysis of the parable of the Good Samaritan. But it is also possible that I may instead come full circle to my Oxford days reading English. My latest book has, sorry, I lost my place. My latest book has started me off in that direction, and I've included a few lines from that book 
on the little event program that you all have in front of you. What I'm trying to do in that last book and what I hope to be doing in this next one, whether or not it focuses on the kenotic, is to try to argue for the fundamental importance of imagination in doing theology. All that you're missing, because I lost that half a page, <laughs> is half a page from a well-published book which is available in our local bookstore. So if you really want to know what I was going to say there, what I was going to read to you, Actually, it's pretty much what's in the inside of the program. So um, to conclude, I know what I was going to say to conclude. What I was going to say to conclude is that I am uh, so grateful for all of your presence here. The people who are here in this room and lots of people beyond this room I know um, have contributed enormously to how uh, how fulfilling my time has been at Fairfield, um, and I uh, hope to continue that relationship with many of you, if only from a different and less professorial standpoint. Thank you all. To close our program, I invite to the podium Dr. Melissa Kwan, Director of Fairfield Center for Social Impact, who organized our event. Melissa. I only have four uh, quick points. The first is thank you all uh, for being here with us to celebrate Paul. Um, thank you, John, um, for all of your, your work and thoughtfulness in helping to plan this event and pull it together. Um, thank you to our panelists uh, for your thoughtful reflections and helping us to celebrate Paul. Um, please, another round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> Of course, thank you, Paul, um, for your gifts to all of us uh, throughout these years. 